And we're live. Okay, excellent. So now we're going to start um, our first um, talk. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Aida Mominajad, um, who is going to be talking to us today about um, um, what the title of her talk is, Toward a Human-like Reinforcement Learning. Um, Aida Mominajad is currently a senior reinforcement learning researcher at Microsoft Research uh, New York. Uh, and uh, she previously worked at Columbia University, uh, Electrophysiology, Memory and Navigation Lab, and she has a background in cognitive computational neuroscience. Uh, she studies how we build models of uh, the world and use them in memory, exploration and planning, among other things. Uh, she combines reinforcement learning, neural networks, machine learning with behavioral experiments, fMRI, electrophysiology, so everything we could dream of for this type of meeting at Maine. So, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Ida Mominajad, and, and um, I'm just going to leave you right with her right now. Thank you, Ida, for accepting the invitation. Thank you so much. Um, I see myself here. Can I have the slides up? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karim. This is a particularly bittersweet conference for me because I really want to see everyone in person. I've been trying to go to Montreal for a while now, and the global pandemic hasn't let me. And there are, the list of speakers is exactly the people that I always love to talk to and people that I look up to. So I'm um, very happy to be here and a little bittersweet moment. I wish I could see everyone in person and joke around the coffee table with. Um, so the title of my talk is slightly different, but it's the same concept. It, I'm, what I'm going to show you is uh, attempts towards a human-like reinforcement learning. I'll try to keep it uh, within the time. So if we don't get to talk about some of the things, feel free to ask me questions at the panel uh, around uh, at 11.30, I think. Okay, so um, the towards human-like reinforcement learning idea, um, the approach that I take towards them or the approach that I've taken so far has been one in which I ask questions like, what algorithms do brains use? And I still ask those questions, just in different ways, uh, with different approaches um, in the different roles that I've taken. For instance, imagine if I wanted to fly from New York City to Tehran. I could think at that level and think about flying from New York City to Tehran, or I could think about the commute that I would have each way in order to go from my home here to, let's say, my parents' home back home. Or I could think about all of the little mini steps that are along the way. Depending on how I look at this, at which scale I'm thinking about this plan, um, I would realize that there is a different kind of requirement for making this uh, plan possible. And the course of action is slightly different. So I'm very interested in this ability, this human ability uh, to use learning algorithms that enable memory and planning. And this is not limited to spatial navigation. It involves social inference uh, or cooking even or playing different kinds of games. Um, the way that I try to test these questions or study how humans uh, use uh, different algorithms or what kind of algorithms they use is one in which I, first of all, decide on a certain number of models and then decide on certain tasks where I can compare, first of all, the behavior of the human and the different models. The tasks should be designed such that the behavior of the alternative models are different enough so I could compare which one of them is more human-like. And remember, this is moving towards a human-like reinforcement learning or towards more human-like AI. So the first thing that a human-like AI needs to do is that it needs to act like a human, show the same kind of behavior. What this means is not that it shows you know, it wins over humans or it shows uber human abilities. It means that it makes the same kind of errors and shows the same kinds of biases and behavior that humans have. And I think that that's a very key thing that we will come back to over and over in this talk. Another uh, part of this is, all right, once I figure that which are the algorithms that can capture the behavior and uh, as anyone who's done any kind of modeling knows, there are so many different algorithms and many different algorithms with particular param parameterizations that could indeed show human-like behavior. So then what do we do? So after that, one can take a look at how the algorithm solved it and then take a look inside the hood, <laughs> inside the human brain or uh, whatever your um, uh, mechanism or organism of choices so that we can figure out whether we can figure out similarities between the representations learned by the machine that solved the same task with human-like behavior and the representations learned by the human uh, according to their brain results. 
Okay, the approach that I use in all of this, I talked to you about the computational models. The approach that I use here is reinforcement learning. And for those of you who don't uh, know much about it, it's an approach in which an, there is an agent, the agent takes some actions, learns something. It's not always representations, not all reinforcement agents learn representations, but you can see my bias here, and plans to achieve goals. Again, not all reinforcement learning agents can do planning equally, and there is a decision-making component in all of them. And you can see it however you like, uh, uh, depending on the model you have chosen. And second, they're neurally plausible. There's various, uh, I guess uh, by this point, there is 20 years, two decades of uh, uh, evidence of direct fits between certain uh, um, uh, reinforcement learning models and neuroscience. Of course, over the course of these two decades, also we found out that some things are not exactly like we thought they were 20 years ago, but that's the nature of science. And that's what makes this framework very exciting. Finally, it enables abstraction, hierarchy, generalization, transfer properties that we would like to have in an agent that could potentially be human-like. And uh, just to give you a little bit of a, a glimpse, if you're not familiar with this approach, this is an approach, the simplest way to um, characterize the reinforcement learning problem is one in which you give a, you're, you're, the agent is given a task in an environment. It has to learn a sequence of actions, which we call policy, to maximize some expected value. Now, this value can be discounted cumulative rewards over future states. Uh, we are currently doing some work on not having any direct reward given to the agent, but having a kind of a internal sense of homeostasis that the agent needs to explore the world to figure, uh, to figure out how to sustain its life. So uh, there are different ways to do this. The classic way, the most simple and the basic way that you would find everywhere is that there is some external reward and you're trying to maximize value with regards to that. But it's by no means the only approach, um, as we will see later on. So in these kinds of environments, you define certain states, for instance, in this grid world that you see on the left um, over here, what you see is a series of like a grid world where here is the start and there is the end and these actions or this policy, the green path is a policy gets you from start to end. Um, this is an example that we used, for instance, in one of our papers. Uh, there is, uh, so there is states, which are these squares. There is actions, which is left, right, up, down in this space. There's policies, which is the sequence. There's an optimal policy. This is the policy that will get you, or the sequence of actions in the state space that will get you to the goal location faster with um, uh, um, maximize, maximizing reward, basically, and being efficient. Options are abstracted policies, and there are also eigen options. People at Montreal have done amazing work on this, doing a pre-cup, Marlos Machado. I recommend you take a look at that. So, Let's come back to the way we wanted to use this framework of reinforcement learning. Again, our question specifically was how do brains algorithms enable kind of flexible planning and memory, right? Now, what are the kinds of flexibility we need here? So when I'm trying to fly somewhere, you know, there are many things that happen. For instance, the flight gate might change, the coffee cart might move, and I cannot function without coffee. So I have to sort of be flexible to figure out where to find coffee so I don't miss my flight. And another thing is that the transition structures can change. In New York City, the A and the F train run on each other's lanes sometimes, and you have to be careful. One and two run on each other. You have to be careful when you're going to Brooklyn from Columbia not to end up at World Trade Center. So those kinds of moments where some transition structures in the world change, wiring, the wiring of the map changes, we want to be flexible to that as well, especially if you live in New York. Um, so one approach to that, and you can see some of the links to papers on the sort of the right lower side of this um, is that perhaps the brain is using certain multi-scale predictive maps and all i'm going to do in this talk is to show you a couple of things i've done around this i will not show you all the papers that are here but i'll show you some in the interest of time um so but but one thing that's important to say is that studying these kinds of behaviors and how the brain might build representations or maps that helps it out, this is not a new topic. So Tolman in 1948 wrote this beautiful review that I recommend everyone to look at, but now we know that potentially Turner did this before, um, is this, uh, had this idea of the cognitive map, reviewing papers from over uh, 20, years. So 1948 is the time where he wrote the review. Things have been going on for decades before this, where various labs, including his own, 
were trying to figure out whether they would they could sort of debunk this behaviorist dogma that you always need some kind of an external sort of reward in order or reinforcement in order to learn something. And this was the behaviorist idea. He wanted to show that even in absence of every reward, uh, there is something to be learned and the rodent is learning it. So there was this latent learning paradigm, which was a very famous one, um, where there were different kinds of rats. One kind of rat, one condition was rats that they, they were put in here and they learned how to navigate to find a food bar. This is one group. Another group, they were put in here for a couple of days uh, without the food bar, and then the food bar was introduced. So if we thought that the food bar is necessary for the rodent to learn the path, then the rodents in the group where they had you know, navigated the maze before shouldn't have learned better. But it turned out that the rodents who had had a few days without any rewards navigating the maze were actually faster at learning the optimal policy or the best path to reach to the reward, which showed that there was something else happening. The, the, the rodent might have been learning the map of the environment even in the absence of rewards. Later on, 30 years later, O'Keefe and Nadell wrote this beautiful uh, sort of uh, book and you know, there was a bunch of different works there. Uh, before that, um, where they were showing that when rodents navigate, uh, their hippocampus in particular uh, has place cells, which are cells that get activated when the rodent is passing through the same location. And then there were the, there was the beautiful discovery of grid cells. Uh, these culminated in a Nobel Prize. And um, this one showed that there were some cells in entorhinal cortex that tiled the space. Later on, we know from other work that there were also prefrontal cortical involvement in uh, the process of cognitive maps. But what these studies didn't show particularly the earlier on, obviously uh, contemporary studies in the past five years have done a, a lot of this work, as you will see in other talks as well, was to show that there is a one, uh, there, there was that they didn't talk about what these cognitive maps exactly looked like. It seemed like um, O'Keefe and Nadell had this idea that it was a one-to-one -one, one uh, uh, allocentric map of the world, uh, which would uh, store basically every step uh, of the way. So this is very similar to the idea of model-based reinforcement learning, which I'll explain to you a little bit more uh, very soon. And then there was the predictive multi-step potential idea uh, where uh, Peter Dan had suggested something that is very close to some other ideas that existed in graph theory, uh, which was this idea of storing how often I uh, expect to visit other nodes on a given graph or other nodes on a uh, path, mm, given I start from a particular location. This didn't think about only probability of transitioning one step at a time and at the moment of decision wouldn't require to just stand there and unroll everything one step at a time. So it would be computationally more efficient, but a little bit more, uh, let's say, it would, it would produce a little bit more errors because it jumps over certain steps. It, it just sort of lumps certain steps together. So the first thing that I'm gonna show you is how um, the theory might look like here, uh, how we can think about these two examples that I gave you. And then I'll show you behavioral and neural experiments. All right, so, uh, let's say that um, we made the world very simple. This is a simple world for a reinforcement learning agent to be able to navigate. This is the simplest way we could uh, uh, sort of test these two models that we decided on, the one-step model and the multi-step model. Remember, the first step is the, the theory, and then the second step is behavior, and the third step is the neuro. Okay, so let's say that the world was very simple. It had only six states. There were two paths, basically. You can think of this as bus lines, if you like. And if you took the one, uh, the, if you took starting state one, you end up with 10 bucks. If you start the, uh, starting state two, you end up with one. So if I asked you right now and we were in an audience and I asked you, do you prefer to start in one or two? If you like money, you would say, I'd like to start in one. Now, what would it look like? So this is the way it might look like to you in the course of an experiment. You go through state one, you open a door, you go to state two, you open the door. Now you have to remember what these rooms look like. There's music to each room that you're not hearing right now. You end up in room three and you sort of open this. There is like 70 bucks for you. Okay, so let's take a look at what uh, different kinds of agents would do here. So for instance, um, um, uh, model three RL, and, I'm, and I have simplified this as much as I could just so that uh, you could see 
um, the difference between these approaches. Is our H zero? What does it mean? It means I'm not, I'm going to tell you very soon that it's not going to be able to solve the kind of flexible changes to the simple world I showed you. So here uh, there is a state, for instance, let's say the Brooklyn Library, which I love very dearly. And then you take an action here and you get some reward. Let's say I, I go to Brooklyn Library, I write, obviously I can't do that right now because of the pandemic. And then I get some reward, which is let's say joy. And so the value of this state library and action, right, is equal to the old value that I had for this plus some learning rate, which is between zero and one, and the new reward that I observed. Um, so if I've never been here before and the value was zero and the, there's no new reward, this can be just, um, let's say, just a new reward. And why would it be between zero and one? Because you don't want to update too much. If something is good once, you don't want to you don't want to get too excited about it. Maybe it's just a fluke. Uh, maybe it's just a fluke. Now, uh, it's not exactly just the reward that matters, but really what matters is how much is this reward different from the last reward you had expected. So let's take a look at a little bit of a more complex uh, situation. Let's say that I go to this library and I write something and I get some reward. Then I pick up a book. You can't see it here, but this is a book here below my, below my image. And uh, then um, I read it and then I get another reward. So there is a state and then there is a following state and that one leads to another reward. So now that I've arrived to this new state, I need to update the reward that I expected from that last one. For instance, I can think the value of being in the library and writing equals the old value of it that I learned above, plus alpha some prediction error. What is a prediction error? This prediction error says, hey, there was a reward that I expected to get, and there was an old value that I have. If these two are equal to each other because I've learned enough, then this would be zero. And then there is a discounted expected value of the next step. What does this mean? This gamma is a discount factor between zero and one. And V of S prime and A prime is the value of uh, picking up the book and reading it, S prime and A prime, right? And so if I combine these together, this gives me a prediction error. If this value is not zero, then I'm going to have a little bit reward added to what I was doing. If this is a bad book, maybe this would be reduced. If this is a good book, maybe this would be increased. This prediction error is the difference between what I expected the value to be and now what I expected to be given some discount, including the value of the future states. This uh, TD or temporal difference prediction error is uh, one of the, at the roots at, at 1996, almost 25 years ago, wow, quarter century ago. Um, this was uh, at the root of some of the, the beautiful traditions of AI, uh, sorry, RL and neuroscience that uh, started to uh, take off. And uh, I recommend that you take a look at that. However, as we know, based on the papers published in the past couple of years, that the story is not as simple as that. But I'm not going to get into that. Now, this approach, this reinforcement learning temporal difference approach, it's very cool but it has this challenge that it only caches expected value. It doesn't have a map. It's fast and it's not flexible. And it doesn't sort of, it can't flexibly update its values uh, when rewards or maps partially change and it hasn't had time to visit everything. It has to always start from the library and experience everything in a sequence to figure things out. Another approach is the model-based reinforcement learning. And this one, as you can see here, it learns a map separately, which is a probability of going to S prime given you started in state S and took action A. So let's say probability of ending up uh, picking up that book given you are in the library and took the action writing. And the reward of every state and action is separately stored. By separating out the reward, the, the sort of the <clears throat> map of the world and the reward, now whatever map of the world, the, the strategies for the map of the world could be different. In this case, it's one step, right? It says, what's the probability of going to a prime given I started in S and these are adjacent states uh, because you have to get there with one action, as you can see. Uh, so this, this, this enhances everything, right? This changes the game because now our rodents who were in the maze can learn this separately even when this one is zero, basically, because now we have separated them. We haven't lumped them all into each other. And what it would look like if I was trying to build a matrix, build a matrix for you of the relationship of these probabilities of transitions, you will have here uh, on the rows, the states where you start from and on the columns, the states where you are gonna end up. So from state one to state three, the probability of transition is one. However, from state 
uh, one to everywhere else at zero, because that's the only place where I can end up with one action, and so on and so forth. So as you can see, if I want to combine this map and this reward in order to compute the value, V star says that it's optimal. Uh, and so as you can see, max A, this is an A, A is the action that maximizes value. Reward in state S and A plus the sum of discounted expected value of the future states that I'm going to visit and the probability of ending up there uh, from the state that I'm currently at. Now, this thing is an iterative thing. It has to go on because then I have to uh, compute value of V star of S prime. So V star of S prime would be here. So this is like a recurrent thing that happens, iterative thing that happens. And uh, it, it's very flexible but it's surprisingly costly, and we'll see in a bit. Another approach that I mentioned to you is this success representation approach. Now here you have the probability of transitioning, this should be one to three and three to five. Um, this probability is uh, combined with this discount factor gamma, which remember it's between zero and one, in order for us to be able to sort of anticipate not just one step at a time, but multiple steps. And unfortunately, this is blocked here, so I'm going to read it for you. So it looks very similar to the TD learning equation that you saw before with one simple difference. Instead of R, you see, or instead of V, you see M. And instead of R or reward, so instead of value, we have M, which is the successor representation or our multi-step map. And instead of reward or R, what we have is accounting. So we have here a count of one added to how much I expect to visit S prime from S plus the discounted future of S prime. And I wish you could see this. And minus the old um, sort of ex uh, successor representations of S. Now, this is an interesting equation because gradually it starts to uh, sort of learn how often do I expect to visit another state starting from one. And this is accounts based. How many times on average do I expect to visit this? Importantly, it's one in which I inherit the future of my successor. I inherit its successors. So I'm in state S and I learn that from S I go to S prime. Now, before I had learned that S prime ends up in, uh, let's say, uh, another state and, and a number of states. And so I'm going to inherit all of the successors of S prime with a discount every time that uh, I visit S prime from a different location. And that's the sort of the beauty of caching the multi-step dependencies in the map representation that you have. So it's no longer a one-step map. It's no longer uh, uh, the, a map in the sense of the colloquial notion of it. It's a map in the mathematical sense of it, which is a mapping between different states, but it's not a it's not loyal to one steps. It has multi-step dependencies. Okay, if we put them side by side, here we had the one-step map and it had probability of transitioning from every state to another, given an action, one action, and the reward. And then we have the multi-step successor representation map, which is the which is not all anymore the probability, but the expected future visitation, the counts of visitation on average that I expect. And this one has a pi. Pi is our policy uh, because this is a policy dependent uh, approach, meaning it depends on what I saw ends up with each other. So it's policy dependent. And the gamma, which is how far into the future can I see? As you can see, when I stand in the row one, I cannot see where it goes other than three. But here, when I stand in row one, I can see where it goes. I can see its future like three and five. And computing the value is much easier. This is that same iterative uh, equation that I had shown you before. This one is a, a different one. This is a simpler one. This is just a linear combination, as it seems. And it is indeed much simpler to compute this and much faster because it just combines the two. For instance, it's sufficient for me to combine this row uh, with the reward vector in order to figure out what's the expected value of one. Easy. Uh, now, I told you that uh, the, the successor representation is policy dependent. Remember that pi index that we have. What does that mean? What this means is that under, uh, uh, if this was, for instance, our maze, this is the starting point and this was the reward. If I had a representation that only showed where I was standing, this is what it would look like. If I had a representation that randomly distributed the policies and had visited everywhere equally and uh, could just tell me what are any directions that I could go, it would look something like this. 
But if I had a representation that was very keen on the location of the goal, uh, like this one, then I would have a map that is biased towards the location where I want to end up. And that's, that's a very interesting approach. And we will see that it has certain kinds of properties. That's the policy dependence of success representation. All right, now let's take, test it in behavior. Okay, I told you before that, okay, when I'm going to an airport, for instance, the rewards might change. This is where they, they move the coffee cup. Why did they do that? And um, so if, if we did the same thing as I mentioned before, but we didn't start in one or two. So remember the approaches that have the requirement to um, visit every state in order to update the success representation of a given state, they're not going to be able to, uh, let's say necessarily um, see these initial states. So you can only update situations where, remember that we had the map separate and the reward separate, only the situations where the maps are one step might solve some problems or others, but situations where rewards change would be equally similar between them. What do I mean by that? So here I ask people to, you know, go around and figure out where pays best, then they're dropped into the third and fourth location, and then they notice that the rewards at the end have moved. Then I put them back in um, states one and two, where do you wanna go now? And uh, if somebody has been paying attention, then they would choose two this time because their rewards have changed. And in this other case, we have um, a transition revaluation. This is like the case where, for instance, the A and the F train lines uh, had sort of moved and they were running on, to, uh, on each other's lanes. So in this case, the rewards haven't changed. So what I need to change is the map. I usually ask people what they think happens, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip here. And I'm just gonna show you uh, what happens inside each of these agents. So let's take a look at this. Remember, this is the reward evaluation. The model free learner had learned one goes to 10. Let's say the gamma and alpha were both uh, one. Uh, so the learning rate and you know the uh, horizon are both one. So this, uh, it's th it says, I know, I got this, one, 10 two, one, so that's what I'm gonna do. So by the time it got here, it hadn't had the opportunity to update one and two, so it's gonna do great. It's just going to completely do the opposite of what it's supposed to do. It's gonna keep insisting on what it was doing before. Success representation, remember its map is separate. It knows one goes to five and two goes to six, combines it with the reward vector that says the reward of five is one and six is 10, because it, it directly observed that, so it had the time to update its reward vector and it can solve it. It's like, I have no problem solving this. Model-based reinforcement learning unfolds everything. It says, oh yeah, one goes to three, goes to five, and that leads to one. Two goes to four and goes to six, and that leads to 10, therefore I choose two. As you can see, this one takes a little bit more time when, he, when it wants to think. Now, what about transition evaluation? Model-free, I'm not gonna bore you, it does not solve this. Success representation, it says, you know, I remember my map, one went to five and two went to six and combines it with the rewards that haven't changed and it chooses wrongly, it chooses state one. Model based does that, you know, long process and it still solves the problem. So our prediction is, uh, but another thing that could happen, of course, is that there is like a, a replay that could happen. And I'm not gonna go into detail about this. I've published some work on it. I'm working on other things about this. Uh, based on memory replay, I could virtually update either this guy or this guy over here. So both model free and a successor representation could be updated uh, via model based training them offline or via offline replay. In those cases, uh, here are the predictions. Model free will not be able to do if Y axis is the evaluation score zero says, I'm still gonna stick with the decision I, I made in the learning phase. One says, I'm going to completely switch and choose the other thing. Model free won't be able to do either. Model based will do both of them fine with a lot of effort. Model free model base combo or model free replay combo would do both of them equally, uh, equally well, not as good as model base, but they can do both of them. Successor representation alone will do this very asymmetrically. And successor representation together with the idea of replay or being uh, updated via model based, whichever of them you use as your version of SR Dyna, Dyna referring to the class of models since the 90s that um, update a representation via either replay or based on, for instance, a memory bank or via, for instance, a, a one step transition map. Uh, it would have a very sort of a 
asymmetric prediction where you're better at reward evaluation versus one in which you need to update the map. So here is what we saw in human behavior. Yeah, uh, I just want to say that you have five minutes left. Thank you so much. Uh, so here, you, as you can see, there is um, a difference between reward and transition evaluation. We see the asymmetry, which looks like this. You might say, hey, what about speed accuracy trade-off? Maybe they were just faster at transition evaluation. Quite the opposite. The y-axis here is revaluation scores, x-axis are the different conditions. Control condition is where nothing changed. And as you can see, they didn't change their decision there. So it shows that they weren't just forgetting in these cases, they know what they were doing. Um, and here you have the reaction times and on, on the y-axis and then on the x-axis is three conditions. As you can see, the transition evaluation is much slower than both of the other conditions, which shows us that they were doing something else in spite of the fact that they, they were performing the worst. And there is a correlation between how long they spent on the uh, transition evaluation response and how well they responded. So obviously something was working. Uh, I did a study that I'm just going to flash it up here and I'm not going to show you um, the study where we showed that if the x-axis had the measure of how much replay the person was doing during the relearning phase, and the y-axis was a measure of how much they were evaluating their behavior, there is a positive correlation there. Meaning, yes, it seems like Dyna is the case, and if we look in the brain using fMRI and have some measure of replay, in this case, we use a cortical measure of replay uh, in category-specific regions, we find that the more I replay that state one, that room one I haven't been to for a while, uh, the more likely I am to show a revaluation later on, which again is not a very model-based thing to do. It's more related to an approach that requires this replay, can benefit from it. Um, with the, uh, the paper that uh, uh, any day now might be uh, prepared for submission, we, uh, then, we then took a look at this in fMRI uh, very briefly together with Evan Russick. What we tried to take a look here was, uh, let's see which parts of the brain similarity of one to five is going to be correlated with an error in transition evaluation. And we found that anterior hippocampus, orbital frontal cortex, and um, dorsomedial medial prefrontal cortex were those regions. This anterior medial prefrontal cortex was a region I had seen during my studies of prospective memory. So it was a fortunate thing to uh, find those same regions many years later. Some interesting properties of the successor representation. Remember I mentioned play cells. The columns of the, play, uh, of the successor representation, as probably uh, Kim Stackenfeld will mention also in her talk, um, are associated with place fields. And the rows of it are basically telling you what the future is. So in an interesting way, the rows say what comes next and the columns say what, what was before I, we got here. How did we get here? Um, okay. So one of the places where we tested this idea of these kinds of relationships between representations of different rooms was using electrophysiology in the human hippocampus. These are patients we are very fortunate to work with that sit there and take a look at the laptop, uh, navigate these spaces that I showed you earlier. And um, these states that I had told you before are uh, different rooms that they navigate from. So when the reward is different, the chest at the end shows a different reward. And when the transition evaluation happens, you open the end of the, at the end of this room and you end up in another room that you didn't expect. So that's how the transition evaluation happens. I showed you this video before in the interest of time. I hope you remember it from the beginning of the talk. Uh, so you see that video, you go through these different rooms, and then you're asked to, to push this, pull this sliding scale towards which um, room, which starting room you think is going to lead to more value uh, by the end. So what I do is I take the 14 cells inside the human hippocampus of this particular patient that we got, that's a good day. A patient with 14 cells in their hippocampus is a good day for me. Uh, so they, um, um, you can, I can take a look at a 14-dimensional vector of how these neurons responded while the person was navigating room one and room two, and then do a dot product or correlation or however similarity you like to measure between those two to see what is the similarity between these different rooms as the patient is navigating in these different rooms. And I have a hypothesis matrix based on the hypothesis of SR Dyna. In the transition evaluation condition, I expect that the similarity between one and three and one and six will go up, and similarity, for instance, between one and four uh, and five will go down. And long story short, I compute this matrix before and after in the learning, and then later on and after evaluation. 
And it turns out that both in terms of one step similarity, and this is the money shot here, in terms of two step similarity, we see that. What do we see? The y axis here is how much change in similarity we observed. And the x axis tells you the similarity between one and room five versus one and room six. As you see here, one used to go to five, but now goes to six. Similarity to room five had decreased, and multi cell similarity between room one and six have increased, and one and five has decreased. All right, I'm not going to have time to mention the study, probably. Long story short, when people navigate in a virtual reality environment that's very realistic, if they know where they're going, it's going to basically, when they know where they're going, uh, their brain shows a pattern similarity between states that are very far from each other. Uh, so across gammas or horizons that are way larger um, in the anterior prefrontal cortex. Uh, but it doesn't show if they navigate a similarly long path, but they are using a GPS that shows them which way to navigate which means that these similarities cannot be explained by similarity to the past because in both case they have navigated, so they have the same similar past. But uh, depends on what you are expecting to visit in the future, for instance. In this case, because they know what they're expecting to visit, they show similarity up to about a kilometer further away. This was done in collaboration with Eva Brunig, and it was data from Navigating Toronto. Okay, long story short, it seems like successful representational learning, these multi-step maps plus replay, might be a good foundation for these multi-scale predictive cognitive maps that the brain might be using in order to do things. And we tested it in behavior and in various neuroscientific experiments. It has been shown across a number of different behavioral and uh, neural studies by various colleagues of mine. It seems to potentially propose a general principle for memory organization. And that's something that I'm working further now with, uh, together with uh, John Langford. Uh, here, I'm, I'm just putting up the pictures of the wonderful people that I'm collaborating with heavily right now. Uh, I think uh, most related might be work with John Langford on what is the efficient structure of memories and what are the different kinds of uh, uh, real algorithmic realizations where we can get similar memory representations that are efficient. And uh, we are currently looking at uh, human-like navigation in 3D games in the context of uh, 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 games in the in uh, sort of uh, that you can play on Xbox, uh, which is also owned by Microsoft. We're modeling some cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, sort of uh, some computational psychiatry based on data that we are receiving from Silver Cloud uh, together with others. I didn't show you how the cognitive maps can be used in computational psychiatry. And uh, um, with Robert uh, Shapar, what we're doing is trying to, and uh, we're trying to see whether uh, we can sort of have agents that learn how to navigate around homeostatically and without explicit rewards. And with Harm, who's also in Montreal, we're working on a project combining NLP and RL. I have other projects going on. I'm not going to mention it. Hopefully, I get all of your questions during the Q&A session because I think I'm a couple of minutes over time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, um, Ida. So um, here we go. Just, um, you can probably see the question, but it can also now go ahead. Should we take questions? So, or? What's happening? Oh! <laughs> oh, thank you. As you can see, we have a lot of excited people in the audience, and. Um, Thank you very much. Thank I think this everyone. is sometimes missing. We don't hear the clapping at these at these art conferences. So <laughs> using it from above. Uh, thank you so much again for this um, outstanding talk. So, um, you. as you can see, I mean, can you see the questions? I'm I'm going to read maybe I one can. or two. Now. We don't have so much time to go through all of them. Um, we can, can probably focus some. on the upvoted ones, but also if there's one um, down the list somewhere that you find most interesting, also free feel course. to pick, pick it up. So I'm very excited that the questions are by people I've often seen at the learning salon. So um, the first one is by, you know, they ask, uh, what can we learn from biologically implausible but human-like AIs? Would you dismiss it because it's too different from us under the hood? I'm very happy that you ask that. This is a conversation I have on a daily basis with my colleagues at Microsoft Research because a lot of um, machine learning engineering applications of algorithms could give us human-like or even uber-human um, uh, approaches and results that either don't seem neurally plausible or uh, do perform always better than humans. 
and I think that we can indeed learn from them uh, for various reasons. Uh, for one, they can help us perhaps improve some algorithms that we are using um, to understand uh, data that we cannot explain yet, uh, either from uh, neuroscience uh, or from uh, you know, conflicting data across different sort of um, uh, results. So one use of them is tool uh, providing new tools and frameworks. Another use of them is, for instance, for prosthetics or uh, uh, neural engineering or approaches that are therapeutic. We don't necessarily need to stick to human likeness in order for them to work. So there are many, many applications here that I think that uh, human like non human like AI could work, including, for instance, depending on the purpose. Um, if I want an AI to which is something that we're working on together with Katya Hoffman, whose face you see up there, uh, um, we want to build AI that plays games on Xbox in 3D games in a realistic way, in a human-like way. It's okay if the algorithm is not exactly, uh, you know, doesn't exactly have a hippocampus and a cerebellum. It's totally fine. Uh, what we need is that when a person is playing with it, feels like this is a this is a friend, this is an ally, especially in multi-aging games that we're working on. The next question is with, by one of my favorite scientists, Paul Chizik. Hi, Paul. I, I, it's wonderful to see you here. He asked, the definition of state in these models are very abstract, considered as nodes on a graph. This has the advantage of being very general and can deal with abstract navigation uh, through states. But in natural behavior, we are often navigating in a real physical space where the states are places. If the human RL system adapted to that physical type of space, will it show certain biases that differ from those of abstract graph-like RL systems? Has this been tested? Fantastic question, Paul. I'm very glad you asked this. Um, there are different parts of the algorithm that uh, roughly correspond indeed, well, algorithms, I have to say, that we can use here, that roughly correspond to different parts of the brain almost. So there is a part where the world comes at me, or I, I come at the world, uh, as a lot of pixels or a sort of a mishmash of so many different perceptual stimuli, and it just sort of uh, arrives to me. And I don't know, um, basically, in these kinds of scenarios, um, what is a state. I have to learn a lot of abstractions to get there. I think some work that we are currently doing with another uh, uh, one of the most brilliant grad students I've actually ever met, I would say. Uh, so Anirudh Goyal, who's a, who's, a, who's a grad student at uh, Montreal, who works with Yashua Bengio. Together, we are working on something um, that um, gets to this point of how do we learn what are the things uh, that, that matter in the environment. He has a paper called um, uh, Object Files and Schemata that I recommend you taking a look at. Um, there is other work by various people who start from this rich observation, pixels in the world, and then learn certain things before then they learn what to do with them. Uh, what you could think is that if there is an earlier stage, which is like the perceptual categorization stage, and there is a later stage of what we do once we have abstracted these states, you're totally right that I have focused on that stage. And uh, if I wanted to do end-to-end -end learning that's human-like, I would need to start from the beginning. And I think that some projects that a lot of people have done and some colleagues of mine are doing at Microsoft Research for learning states from rich observation stimuli or projects that we're doing with Anirudh potentially could get us there, where we have also that state of just figuring out what in the world matters, what are objects from all these sort of things that are coming at us, and then having those abstract states have relationships with each other. Do we have time for I, more? Either, or I... just, I'm really sorry. Um, we, in the interest of time, I think we will no have to, to move on. There are so many questions, and they will be available afterwards. And also, there's a panel discussion. So, looking forward to the panel. Know, um, that's happening at um, half past uh, 11 to half past 12 Montreal time. There's a panel discussion. So, either will be back with us on that panel discussion. So, thank you once again for this uh, brilliant yeah. talk. Um, thank everybody for the questions. Um, again, these recordings will be available for all the people that are asking, so you'll be able to watch, rewatch, and rewatch this again. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and um, we're going to now close this, um, this session, and we will be preparing the speaker for the next session. Um,